Hello and welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sox. And I'm Lori Sox. And today we're talking about a pretty big event in our lives. Liam goes to middle school. Middle school is a lot. Yeah. It's a different beast than elementary school. In elementary school, I think maybe because we start out with kindergarten and crayons and they're babies. So middle school, I don't know when we thought about it, which was big. It was a big deal. Well, it's a big deal because it's usually, and it is in our case, a different campus. And also, I believe it's a national thing that middle school starts multiple teachers and multiple subjects of classes. You have Everything a different is teacher so every many more, yeah. class. So many new challenges. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And then also, it's you look at Liam in sixth grade, but it's so close to fifth grade and still being elementary school with kids who are in eighth grade that are going to be in high school. So that that age difference, there's so many different facets of middle school that can make it overwhelming. And I think about the anxiety, though, that I felt when Sophia went to middle school. And really, none of that is there. It was there. I remember when we were planning on middle school before we changed schools, that overwhelming sense of you know, would Liam get lost in the crowd? What would his support be? Would they educate him? The implementation of his IEP was such a train wreck at Carpenter Community Charter that it just the thought of how that would be any better was overwhelming until we found the new school. And with the new school, those anxieties really have subsided. Because first of all, their sixth graders are away from the seventh and eighth graders to give them and honor that transition time, which I love. And they also have that same creed, that same mission that we like. So we know the school. It's not a new school. It's a no, new campus. It's a new campus, but still the same constructs of the classroom and changing classrooms and multiple teachers and everything are still there. Still, no, we don't have the same anxiety that we had when Sophia went off to middle school to this large campus with changing classes and the same worries. We had really the same worries with her. Will will she get lost in the crowd? Will she receive her education? Will her voice be heard? Big kids with little kids and there's so many other things. And you're not supposed to compare your kids which is what we've always been told. So for better or for worse, we are comparing them and just moving forward with an indifference for middle school, which is really freeing. I don't think I've ever felt this way about education for Liam. No, I've never felt this way about education for Liam, much less going into something that is middle school. Yeah. That can be really overwhelming. And I believe that the peace that we feel comes in part from the complete hell that we went through in Carpenter Community Charter. No doubt. For his elementary school. And we've done a really good job of not saying the name of his elementary school because... The old elementary school. The old elementary school. um, Because there is a part of me that feels like it's behind us and I don't like to... I don't know. I did, I, the the least amount of energy I can give to them is the most amount of peace that I can give to myself. And I believe that there's a relationship there with the peace that I have and the anger I feel. Like if I'm in a peaceful place, then it's just the old school. But I just read a quote from Salman Rushdie, and it really moved me. A poem cannot stop a bullet. A novel can't diffuse a bomb, 
but we are not helpless. We can sing the truth and name the liars. Mm. I mean, he's, he's been an example of the power of our words and literature. And this poem really struck me because I had to think about all of the time that I did feel helpless and the relationship with his old elementary school was so abusive. And I feel like as parents, we suffer through abuses that we shouldn't have to suffer through in the education system. The The relationship there is so negative and abusive. And you can feel helpless. But this poem reminded me that we're not helpless, no matter how many times we might feel it, that we do have a voice. We have our words. We have the power of our words. And they're important. The words that we speak over our children, the words that we tell our children, the words that we tell ourselves, the words that we use to advocate, they're so important. And those words are our strength. They're our power. And, and I'm reminded of it. And so, yes, I will call out the liars. I'm thankful, though, for what we came through. <laughs> Mostly thankful for what we left behind. Thankful that we left it behind. We may still have challenges ahead of us, but they're going to be different because now we have the wisdom and experience and the insight. And maybe, finally, we're going to trust ourselves and our instincts. There's such a battle to have things the way we want them because we know what we're fighting for is right. And in most cases, they're rights. And we want those to be upheld. There's a battle to make things into something different. And that is really good where there is change or the possibility of change. And I think that that is what we always held on to for, what, eight years? Oh, we stayed in the school so long. It was the possibility of changing minds and systems and I think one of the most heartbreaking conversations we had with our lawyer was when she said, you're not going to change the system. And it's so hard for me to accept that. It's funny. I've never really talked about this out loud, but I felt a little embarrassed after that. I felt like the person in a relationship where all their friends are like, this isn't the right person. This isn't, you're not going to change this person. They, they are who they are. They're showing you who they are. But then you get in a relationship and the, the, the deeper the relationship keeps going because the longer it's there. And, and I'm going to change them. But we know we don't change. <laughs> change like, I think, but it's such a hard, it's, a, it's such a challenge to like accept because you're looking at rights. You're work, looking at fundamental rights to an education. You're looking at something that isn't like he makes noise when he eats. It's not that what we're Plus, changing. in the past, we've seen change. We've seen positive change. And we so have. that may not be the best analogy, but I felt that way. I felt a bit embarrassed, like, ah. Of course, right. I'm not going to change this group of people. It's so inappropriate that it so much feels like a bad relationship. Like I have compared it to a Taylor Swift song. I've really used sometimes Taylor Swift's lyrics, you know, in pickup to just be like, oh, you're going to be as mean. And that is one of the problems that I have is that it shouldn't feel that way. That isn't something that we as parents should be be feeling about education. Education to some point is cut and dry. I know there's a lot of other parts of it that aren't cut and dry, but the actual like obtaining the opportunity for equal education, that should be pretty much cut and dry. And then the other little facets I get, there's details and things to be worked out, but just the everyone here is going to receive an education and not I'm going to pull you and I'm going to really, really make it hard to receive and education and your civil rights. And they do it with a smile, which is really what is so hard. And they, and in our case, they did it with a lot of, we love Liam, we love him. And either you get through that elementary school and you're just going to the next school, or you leave, or you stay and you decide that you're just going to, you know, I'll just make everything all right. I'll, I'll smooth it over on my end. You say, oh, they're the professionals. Let them, they know, they know. And you don't have to think, you don't have to stress, but the damage is being done. The thing is, the damage was still done, but we fought like tooth and nail. And so that's the thing is that like if you're in a situation where you see 
that the collaboration is there and the possibility of growth is there, then change is possible. But when it's not, there is a certain point for everyone and it's different for everyone. For some people, it's the moment that you walk in the door and that's great. It took us eight years and then the actual like denial of an education. But what I was trying to say is that it, it can be hard because we want to change things. And I think that when we're working towards the pot where there's a possibility of change, it's a different situation than when we see, no, it's never gonna change. And that's when you walk out the door and you take your red scarf and you remember it all too well. So that's a Taylor Swift reference to for everybody. That everybody knows. <laughs> so I am glad I came through it, but mostly just glad that I'm through with it, through with that. And I'm glad to be through with the people who worked so hard to keep my son down. We will never get back what was lost. But if we choose, we will never lose what was gained. And for the sake of my heart, that is where I have decided to place my focus. That we know best. As parents, our instincts know. And until they prove that we don't know, we're going to trust our instincts. We're going to trust who Liam is, who Liam shows us that he is, what we know about our son, what we feel and know. Because we didn't for so long. That knowing was replaced with guilt or doubt. Yeah, we second guessed when, you know, something didn't sound or feel right. Because, I mean, there's no way that someone would actively work to limit Liam, you know. But, but, the, <laughs> but there was a way, and they did. So, we, you know, we can't act surprised about that, really. We can't act surprised anymore. Mm -mm. And I think that when you say that... Um, that we thought there's no way that someone could or would actively try to suppress his right to an education. That's what gets us as parents because it, it's not making sense the whole time. The whole time we're thinking, mm, and that's why we doubt ourselves because we're looking at it and we're seeing it, but that's not right, right? That's not real. And so we doubt. Saying they wouldn't do that. And then when we see them do it, it would be like, why would someone do <laughs> that? Isn't That's the funny? surprise. Like we can't. Yeah. And so I can't really. No, we can't be surprised anymore. It can continue to happen and it did continue to happen. But the fact that it surprised me, I allowed it to surprise me when it shouldn't have been surprising for maybe the last six or seven years. Like the first year when it's, you know, kindergarten and you're fighting for the placement and all of that. And you're new to the district and, and to the fight. Yeah, it's surprising. But then they do it a second year and a third year. And then there's infractions against their IEPs and not upholding it and not non-inclusive and all of those things. Then it shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> it just is, right? Someone's showing you. So I can't act surprised at the possibility or the actuality of it happening but I can take a different path now. And this one is with my eyes wide open. I can go down the actual path that is in front of me, regardless if I like it or not, empowered by the truth, empowered by knowing and trusting my instincts to do what is best for my son. Seeing it is the first part. Accepting. Acceptance is the first step in so many different things. And acceptance of this is how it is, it makes it easier because then you're living in how it is. And that, that's the, that is really where the change happens. Showing up is the advocacy and being present in the present in that moment is where the change happens. So Liam's going into sixth grade, and his last week of summer is squeezed in between drop-offs and pickups for Sophia, who started a couple weeks ago. His last week of summer is a front-loading that this is the last week of summer. 
Don't you want that? Like, because Sophia's known when the last week of summer is since the first week of summer that we get to the last week of summer and say, all right, this is the last week of summer. And there's something about that that I'm envious about because it makes me think that he's enjoyed every day of summer so much more because the date of its end wasn't like a known, wasn't like written and stamped on the calendar. So maybe it's more for me than for him. Yeah, because he just kind of does what he's supposed to do. He's in the moment. Yeah. What it does to my day is such a shift of just bringing me like there, right there, in the reality of what's really in front of me. And it's a different way of approaching what's right in front of you. Yeah, when he does start school and like it's been in the past, he... He isn't the kind that's going to dream about the lazy days of summer that passed him. How many days till fall break or yeah. winter break? or? We can say during the week, hey, it's Thursday, it's Friday, the weekend's coming. But that's about it, right? I think he, I know he enjoys Friday. Like he's like, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, it's not beyond the week, beyond mm-hmm. the day. It's not something that, I mean, when he thinks about it, uh, you know, we can have, I'm not just saying Liam doesn't understand the future. I'm saying no. that, you know, it's, he's not preoccupied with the future. He's living in the moment. And that's really, mm-hmm. that's really what this whole evolution has brought me down to inspired by him, for him, through him. It's like, that's, I, when you see someone in the moment, you're reminded how out of the moment you are. He just does what is in front of him. You know, like the four weeks of summer school, it wasn't a he just did issue it. for him. No, he didn't complain. He did it. He loved the Kahoot. Mm-hmm. And it was fun. And we did it. And it was just like, all right, this is the time of day. But tell me. All right, so I'm going to do math. Then I'm going to do English. And then I'm going to get my iPad. Great. That's it. Just let me know my schedule. And for me, it was really great to sit next to him and do the work and see how much he learned the last Uh, six months of elementary school at his new school to see his confidence. It was a different experience than what we had experienced during uh, the pandemic and with distance learning, doing it all ourselves. So he had tools and he was there and it was a new moment. And the way he approached it reminded me to just be in that moment. So we don't know how to prepare for middle school, prepare Prepare is a big thing. That's like part of his IEP, to be prepared, to be front-loaded. Middle school is what most people look back at as the most awkward part of their education experience. That time with puberty and you're not a little kid anymore, but you're not quite an adult anymore. There's many, many movies and sitcoms that explore it. We're aware of the importance of friends, the importance of self-advocacy against any bullies. And no matter how inclusive an environment is, there will always be bullies Mm -hmm. of some sort, of some variation, because it's, (laughs) they're just, they're kids and every kid is figuring it out. Well, it's nice to have the one-on-one aid because let's face it, bullies don't attack when adults are around. Because bullies, by nature, are weak. They're insecure. They, they go where it's safe, you know, where they think they can get away with stuff. And uh, so that brings a little a bit of peace of mind, a bit of a relief. Well, yeah, because my usual feelings would be that would be fear because Liam could be a safe haven if a bully was so inclined. And he doesn't tell on people. So No, he very rarely tells on people. We're working on it in his IEP for him to tell on people. <laughs> We're also working on him getting in trouble. <laughs> like, like that's a goal for him to get in trouble and then to be able to kind of deal with those feelings and tell on people. <laughs> Sometimes his goals sound really funny when you say them out loud. <laughs> like the things that he has to learn. He has to learn to tell on people. Mm-hmm. He has to learn to get in trouble. Those are two things that come really naturally to most kids. And we take it for granted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Sophia still tells on him. 
That was something I actually had to do the opposite of Sophia. I had to say, you have to stop telling on your brother because he doesn't tell on you. But one day he will. And you're teaching him to tell on you for everything. She's a good big sister, though. She's actually a great big sister. The best moments are when we go someplace and it's me and the two of them. And they kind of join up together. Right? And I'm odd man out. And I love it to see them like collaborate and console each other and make plans to watch them hold each other's hand in front of me when they walk. They don't know. They don't know the joy it brings just just watching them side by side. Do you want to talk about the orientation? (laughs) The or okay, well the orientation is it's middle school. So it's, we are finding our way to learn from what we've been through and approach this new environment in a healthy beginner's mind, being here, seeing things kind of way. So we went to an orientation and I introduced myself to a man I had communicated with several times over email and someone who worked at the school yes and this is challenging for me because I might sit behind this microphone and talk but it's hard for me to walk up to people and introduce myself that's that's hard for me but I thought new beginning new school I'm going to put myself out there and It was strained and awkward, and I felt like I was fighting to move the conversation forward. And this was just an introduction. You were asking questions, and it was like one-word replies. Yeah, but it wasn't even questions. It was like, hi, this is my name. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was like even less than questions. I was just trying to get past. I'm Liam's mom. This is Yeah. Yeah, it was just like, okay, I thought, because the emails were, you know, warm and fuzzy. Uh, And honestly... The new school's elementary school, even though it was only six months, we just had relationships there. And um, I just felt like I, I was missing some piece of the puzzle or I was saying the wrong thing. And this m- brought back <laughs> feelings I've had before. And so I walked away bothered and irritated. And I told you And then I just sat there wondering why we were even there. Not at the school, because it just takes me about three seconds to remember where we could have been. And I know why we're there at that school. No, but there's effort to go on orientation. And it's not something that we really love doing. I think you would have rather just kind of sit in the corner and just kind of listen to people. I could have just sat at that orientation and listened and left. But I thought, I'm going to do this. Because I always leave it up to you. Like Stephen is the social one. He's the one who like forms that. And then my, like we have our roles that we play. And I thought, you know what? This is new. I'm not going to just put myself in a box. I'm going to be open to everything. But there are always going to be those apples. You know, even in a place where you don't expect to find them. And I was told to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I thought, hadn't I, when I approached him, right, given him the benefit of the doubt, like I thought that we were going to have a conversation that was nice. I was told that he was a nice man, maybe having a bad day, which I don't know what to do with that because we are all nice individuals, maybe having a bad day. That's everyone, every human from the moment they open their eyes to the moment they close their eyes, has an array of experiences from one moment to the next. And it can be across the board, so many different things. Then we choose our focus, or maybe your whole day is awesome, or maybe your whole day just really stinks. That's everyone. And you know what? We work really hard to honor everyone's space and their right to hold those spaces. Like that's just, that's an active part of, of how we want to live. And I understand when I come across someone, I don't know their story and they don't know mine. I get that. But here at school, when I'm meeting a teacher 
that is supposed to be a part of my son's team. And this is not something I'm bragging about. (laughs) I don't think it's necessarily a positive. And it's something that I'm really working on. I don't have any room for excuses for bad manners. And that's what it is. I'm holding space because I don't know anybody else's journey. They don't know my journey. And in a school, a parent of a child with an IEP, there are some things that you can infer. So to further complicate or to make them feel anything other than support, I have tolerated that before. I no longer have room for the excuses or the bad manners much like Paddington the bear. (laughs) If you don't know Paddington 1 and 2, seriously, how he describes bad manners is like, yeah, understanding everyone is different is one thing. But on the same token of they are allowed to be them, I am allowed to be me with my life and my peace and my journey. Yeah, what got me was it wasn't a neutral space either. It wasn't just a Starbucks where these are two humans going to the Starbucks. We're at this person's place of work, this person's skill set environment. You should probably be seeing this person at their best. You know, if you're an employee someplace, you kind of have a bad day. You fake it till you make it. You, You cover a lot of stuff. It's not coming from the most honest place all the time because you're, you're doing a service. And we've all been in line at Starbucks and and witnessed someone being inappropriately mean to the poor person that's just trying to make their coffee. And that person, the barista, can't just act like they would if they were on the street. Mm -mm. There's, okay, protocol. And this instant might have been something nothing to other people. It might have been just like a hmm to somebody else. But to me, I've seen this before. I've seen where it went. And so, you know, I'm still learning and also going into it thinking, hey, I'm just going to be there. And it just backfired. It backfired. What I used to do didn't really work for me. So I'm trying to change and be there in the moment. And there are no excuses for excuses for bad manners. There are reasons, but it's no excuse for bad manners. You were rude to me. It bothered me. That is that. I won't excuse it away, but I will accept that we have gotten off on a foot that has a rock inside of its shoe. And we're going to go from here. And I will try to approach you with an open mind. I accept I can be stubborn and that my tolerance for this crap is next to nothing. I've made excuses in the past. I've looked the other way. And all of that is used up. It's futile. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. And I'm not willing to learn again that it doesn't work. Because excuses are never available for Liam to rely on. He doesn't make excuses. You're the teacher. This is your house we're coming to. You're the one who threw the party and said that everyone was invited. It's not my business that you're having a hard day. Not today. Not at orientation. What you're teaching me is that our relationship is at the mercy of your mood, the difficulty of your day. And you have the inability to be objective. All of which would get my child sent to a special day class away from his peers. All the excuses in the world does not make that okay. The day before me, the job before me, I can see that now. I can just be in this uncomfortable place, something that I don't think that we allowed ourselves because it hurt too much. It's taken me this long to realize I would rather be in this uncomfortable place than pretending. Pretending may feel better, but in the end, where does it take us? It it didn't, it didn't really take us anywhere to not see it and feel it. 
there are good people here at this school. That's why we're at this new school. They believe in inclusion. And everyone needs to be compassionate. We need to be compassionate and empathetic to everyone. This is true. I know that. I'm just saying, I, I just acknowledge the fact that I don't have tolerance for bad manners. Me, that's a flaw that's come from this journey. And even though it's come from this journey, that's not an excuse for it. It's just something that I'm really, really working on. But the truth of the matter is if I step outside is I should not be receiving this from a teacher and you shouldn't receive it. But if a teacher does something like this, you're equal on that path. You are both human beings. You can have a conversation or you can just walk away and accept that is who that teacher is. And choose your focus like we do in life. Everyone is responsible for kindness. And I may be frustrated by that person, but I'm still responsible for the way I respond. Everyone needs to be compassionate in and to the situation. The anger can set itself so close to the surface that when I experience this, this kind of exchange, I step backwards sometimes. I forget myself and I forget what matters in the scheme of things. Kindness is where the change happens. With Liam, we were never allowed that place of admiration for his teachers. We still participated in teacher appreciation. When they sh went on strike, we supported them with food. And I was jealous. I was so jealous of the other parents who were just so enthusiastic about how lovely their teachers were and what hard workers they were. And these were the same people with the exception of a few, two. Yeah, two teachers. But that, that's kind of, a, I mean, you think about the amount of teachers that he has, that's a low percentage. With the exception of those two, every other teacher had for the most part, either verbally or through actions said, we are not going to educate your child. We're not responsible. This is too much work. This isn't part of our job. Those words were spoken to us from teachers at Carpenter. So we were denied the admiration for his teachers. One of the most noble professions. Historically, that's what we know teachers to be, right? They educate our future. But we were denied that. Because we were told by these teachers that they were not going to educate for our son's future. And then all the pandemic did was shine a light on the fact that our son was not receiving an equal education or his supports. And the more time that passed, it just disintegrated into nothing. So we wanted to be wearing those t-shirts that said, teachers rule. And we just didn't feel it. We knew that it wasn't all, all teachers we saw the underbelly, and it was really isolating. I would have worn it last year. Yeah, because <laughs> that was the past. So we're here, and we're now, and we're afforded the opportunity of hope. We still went in doubtful, just because it's hard for me to trust in an educational setting. And I met his teacher, who was so excited to meet him, who was open to finding the best way to support him to learn. And her smile and her words, I, I could have put on a t-shirt that day. I could have. I think the gift of it all, of everything that's behind us, is not necessarily a strength, but an opportunity to be alive in every moment and not take anything for granted. But also to know that if a challenge arises, we'll get through it. We may or may not have what it takes. But we'll find a way through. We'll find the next moment by actually being present in this moment. This, I mean, this is one of the gifts of Liam. This is one of the gifts of being on this journey with him is that, you know, I used to always say whatever we got through made us stronger. I saw this really, my friend had posted this really insightful comment about it doesn't have to be about strength. Not everything has to be so strength-based. Just because we got through, we don't have to be strong. It's just getting through. And he got through, right? He got through. Mm -hmm. Elementary school, he's going to middle school. Liam is going to middle school. 
and it's in an inclusive environment, unlike anything that we've known before. But here's the thing. It's not a savior. No, it's not perfect. It doesn't have to be. I'm not going to put that expectation on it because these are humans. And by nature, humans are flawed. We are humans. We are flawed. Real life, flawed beings. What I will be, though, is alive and present here. And I'll strive to see things as they are. Not be surprised. Not be surprised not only by the challenges, but I'm not going to be surprised when something is good and when it works and when they see my child and when they love my child and when they support my child and they teach my child. I am not going to be surprised by that. I'm going to be there. And I don't know what it will be, but I will be there and I will tell you what it will be because I'm not even going to try to think about what it will be. We're going to continue to do the work and we're going to let people be who they are and we're going to deal with that reality. I just want him to have the supports he needs to access this curriculum. (laughs) That's all we've ever wanted, isn't it? And maybe he can make a friend. Or two. No, really, I just want him to be there, confident, liking himself. And I think that's a goal that most parents have for any child, especially when they're going to middle school. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod, and you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod. Or visit our website, ifweknewthen.com, to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then. If We Knew Then.